Come As You Are by Michael Azarad, first printed in the United States of the American Spy Fox, October 1993, copyrighted by Michael Azarad, 1994, for Julie, Chapter Zero. It's April 9th, 1993 at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. 11,000 people, grunge kids, jocks, metalheads, mainstreamers, punks, little kids with their parents, hippie types, have come from as far away as Los Angeles and Seattle to see Nirvana's first American show in seven months months, a benefit for Bosnian rape victims. Besides a seven-week club tour in late 1991, the closest most American fans have come to seeing the band in concert was their appearance on Saturday Night Live over a year before. So much has happened in the meantime. Drug rumors, breakup rumors, lawsuits, and about five million more copies of the Nevermind album sold worldwide. And much hasn't happened. A US arena tour, a new album, it's a crucial show. The band walks out on stage. Kurt Cobain sporting an aqua cardigan, an inside out Captain America t-shirt, and decomposing blue jeans gives a nervous little wave to the crowd. He's dyed his hair blonde for the occasion. A mop of it obscures his eyes and indeed the entire top half of his face. From the opening chords of Rape Me, the band plays with explosive force. Salvos of sound catapulting off the stage and into the crowd. Breed, Blue, Sliver, Milk It, Heart Shaped Box. Toward the end, they play, quote unquote, the hit, and even though Kurt mangles the opening chords, the moshers on the floor go berserk. As matches and lighters are held aloft during lithium, everyone in this cavernous barn is reminded of exactly why they love Nirvana. Although Chris Novoselic and Kurt are at least 30 feet apart, they move and react to each other as if they are much closer. The communication is effortless. Midway through the set, Kurt calls over to Chris, I feel great, I could play another hour, and they do, packing 24 songs in an hour and a half, including 8 songs from the upcoming album. The crowd applauds the new stuff enthusiastically, especially the ferocious assault on Scentless Apprentice and the Majestic All Apologies, which dissolves in a haze of mantra chant and feedback. Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam watches from the side of the stage. Not far away is the Melvin's Dale Crover. Francis Bean Cobain is upstairs in her dad's dressing room with her nanny, Courtney comes down just in time to dodge a plastic bottle of mineral water that Kurt has thrown without looking. She waves at him sarcastically. At the end of the set, Kurt, Chris, and Dave Grohl disappear behind the drum riser and pass around a cigarette as they discuss what songs to play, then return for a seven-song, half-hour encore, climaxing with Endless Nameless, the mystery track that closes Nevermind. As the band accelerates the song's main riff, it becomes a trance. Kurt walks across the top of his amp stack. It's not that high up the ground, but he's riveting anyway, like a potential suicide walking along the ledge of a building. The music speeds up even more. The guitars are squalling. Chris has unstrapped his bass and is waving it in front of his amp. Dave Grohl flails with precise abandon. As the music peaks, Kurt falls hard onto the drum set, and drums and cymbal stands fall outward, like a carnivorous flower opening up and swallowing its prey. Show over. People ask each other if he's alright. It's not showmanship. If it were, they'd put down padding first. Maybe it's a geek stunt, like the kid in grade school who would make his nose bleed and smear the blood on his face so the bully would leave him alone. A case of, I'll hurt myself before you can, from a guy who opened the set with a song called Rape Me. Perhaps it's an homage to two of Kurt's favorite stuntmen, Evil Knievel and Iggy Pop. Or is it that he's so jazzed up from the music that he's impervious to all physical harm? Like a psyched up swami who can walk across hot coals? Judging by the audio, all agog and aglow. That last explanation seems to fit the best. Afterward, the entire entourage celebrates the triumphant gig in the courtyard of the trendy Phoenix Motel, except for Kurt and Courtney, who have retired to a fancy hotel across town. The Phoenix, Courtney says hold some bad memories for them. And besides, the bath towels are too small. Even without them, the place has turned into a little Nirvana village. Dave and his mother and sister are there. Chris and Shelly are there. So is smiling Ernie Bailey, the guitar tech, and his wife Brenda. Tour manager Alex McLeod, lighting designer Suzanne Sasek, folks from Gold Mountain Management, Mark Cates from Geffen DGC, even members of Seattle's Love Battery who happen to be in town. Chris goes down to the grocery store and gets a couple of armloads of beer 
and the party lasts into the wee hours of the morning. The next day, Chris makes a pilgrimage to the fabled Beat Landmark, the City Lights bookstore. He goes outside to a cash machine where a homeless man announces, Good news, people. We are pleased to accept $20 bills for Easter. Chris gives him one. The Cow Palace show was a victory. It seemed like a confirmation that a punk rock band that hit the mainstream jackpot wasn't a fluke after all. That victory had repercussions for the band. All the bands like them, and maybe even the culture at large. As Sonic Youth's Kim Gordon said recently, when a band like Nirvana comes out of the underground, it really expresses something that's going on in the culture and it's not a commodity. What was going on in the culture was reflected not only in the sound of the music, but just as importantly, how it became popular. The punk rock phenomenon started practically the moment Johnny Ramone first put Pick to String, inspiring a decade and a half's worth of hard work by countless bands, independent record labels, radio stations, magazines, and fanzines, and small record stores that struggled to create some sort of alternative to the bland, condescending corporate rock which was being foisted on the public by the cynical major labels, the impersonal arenas, the mega-sized record stores, the lowest common denominator radio stations, and the star-struck national rock magazines. Galvanized by the punk rock revolution, the music underground formed a worldwide network, a shadow music industry. It grew and grew until not even the best efforts of the baby boomer controlled music industry could hold it back. REM was the first explosion. Jane's addiction came later, and then came the Big Bang, Nevermind. Nevermind has sold over 8 million copies worldwide to date. It defied the best efforts of the likes of Michael Jackson, YouTube, and Guns N' Roses, and hit number one on the Billboard album chart. After this, everything was either pre or post Nirvana. Radio and press started taking the alternative thing seriously. Suddenly, record labels were rethinking their strategy. Instead of heavily promoted lightweight pop that would sell well at first and never be heard from again, they decided to start signing acts with long-term potential. And they were promoting them from a more grassroots level instead of throwing money at them until they started selling. This was an imitation of the way Nirvana broke, a small core group of grassroots media and music fans whose valuable word of mouth expanded to the group's base little by little at first, and then by leaps and bounds. Minimum hype, just good music. The investigative zeal required in order to make one's way through the morass of independent music was in effect a rebuke of herd consumerism. It was a pesky development for the major labels who had come to depend on promotional dollars to make the public see their way. Independent music required independent thinking, all the way from the artist who made the music to the entrepreneurs who sold it, to the people who bought it. It's a lot harder to track down that new Calamity Jane single than it is to pick up the latest CNC Music Factory CD. In 1990, not one rock album hit the number one spot, prompting some industry pundits to prophesy the end of rock. The audience for the music had been systematically fragmented by radio programmers looking for the perfect demographic, and it appeared unlikely that rock fans could unite around one record in large enough numbers to put it at the top of the charts. And while rock degenerated into a blow-dried, highly processed faux rebellion, genres such as country and rap more directly addressed the mood and concerns of the masses. Although several other rock albums hit number one in 1991, Nevermind united an audience that had never been united before. The twenty-somethings. Tired of having old fogies such as Genesis and Eric Clapton or artificial creations such as Paula Abdul and Millie Vanilli rammed down their throats, the twenty-somethings wanted a music of their own, something that expressed the feelings they felt. A staggering number are children of divorce. They had the certain knowledge that they were the first American generation to have little hope of doing better than their parents. The generation that would suffer for the fiscal excesses of the Reagan 80s, that spent their entire sexual prime in the shadow of AIDS, that spent their childhoods having nightmares about nuclear war. They felt powerless to rescue an embattled environment and spent most of their lives with either Reagan or Bush in the White House, enduring a repressive sexual and cultural climate, and they felt helpless and inarticulate in the face of it all. Throughout the 80s, Many musicians were protesting various political and social inequities, but most of them were boomers like Don Henley, Bruce Springsteen, and Sting. And many fans saw this protest for what it essentially was, posturing, bandwagon jumping, self-righteous, self-promotion. 
Exactly why did Duran Duran appear on Live Aid anyway? Kurt Cobain's reaction to bad times was as direct as can be, and a hell of a lot more honest. He screamed. It's a mistake to call Kurt Cobain a spokesman for a generation, though. Bob Dylan was a spokesman for a generation. Kurt Cobain isn't supplying any answers, and he's barely even asking the questions. He makes an anguished wail, reveling in negative ecstasy. And if that is the sound of teen spirit these days, so be it. The songs on Nevermind might have been about alienation and apathy, but alienation and apathy about things that didn't mean much anyway. By contrast, the band has expressed strong feelings about feminism, racism, censorship, and especially homophobia. And any hint of passivity was blown away by the awesome force of the music, particularly Dave Grohl's explosive drumming and the undeniable craft of the songwriting. This was passionate music that did not pretend. Getting into Nirvana was empowering for a generation that had no power. The early lives of the band members echo that of their generation. All three come from broken homes. All three, and even their previous drummer, led painfully alienated childhoods to our high school dropouts. Although they're considered part of the Seattle sound, they're not a Seattle band. Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic come from the isolated coastal logging town of Aberdeen, Washington. The band came of age there and in nearby Olympia, home of K Records and the naive pop band Beat Happening, both major philosophical, if not musical, influences on Nirvana. When Kurt talks about punk rock, he doesn't mean green hair and safety pin nostrils. He means the do-it-yourself, be-yourself, low-tech ethos of K, Touch and Go, SST, and other fiercely indie labels. It's an effort to reclaim music from the corporate realm and bring it back to the people, to make it electronic folk music. The members of Nirvana clearly weren't corporate employees. They visited their label's LA headquarters exactly once. The band carefully defined themselves as being outside an idealized, generic mainstream as concocted by Madison Avenue, television executives, the major record labels, and Hollywood. To use a now co-opted term, Nirvana presented an alternative. When 8 million people said they felt the same way, the mainstream was redefined. Many bands in the charts made good enough music, but it was merely entertainment. This music had resonance. It wasn't slick. It wasn't calculated. It was exhilarating, frightening, beautiful, vicious, vague, and exultant. And not only did it rock, but you could hum along to it too. Fame was not something the band wanted or was equipped to deal with. It was a surprise. It was embarrassing to them. It was too much too soon. Chris and Dave took it hard enough, but Kurt took it harder. They lay low for much of 1992, and by the early spring of the following year, Kurt, Chris, and Dave could look back on everything that had happened with 2020 hindsight. Dave told his side of the story at the laundry room the modest Seattle recording studio he co-owns with his old friend and drum tech Barrett Jones. Sitting on the floor amid instruments, amps, and cables, he wore a K Records button on his button-down shirt and wolfed down a toxic meal from the nearby 7-Eleven. Dave is articulate, poised well beyond his 24 years. He is extremely self possessed. He harbors no delusions of grandeur, nor will he sell himself short. He's the most well-adjusted boy I know, Kurt is fond of saying. Dave is the least visible of the three. After all, he's not six foot seven like Chris Novoselic, and he's not the front man like Kurt Cobain. Like Chris, he goes to shows in Seattle all the time, and can be found standing in the crowd, just like everyone else. He's in an ideal position, and he knows it. He's in one of the most successful rock bands on the planet, yet he can go out on the town for the evening and count the number of people who even recognize him on one hand. Chris has a heart of gold, says a family friend. He is a good soul. Chris speaks slowly, cautiously, and although he's not a book-learned intellectual type, he's a genius of horse sense, always ready with plain-spoken perceptions that cut through the bullshit. A self-described news junkie, he is deeply concerned and deeply knowledgeable about the situation in what was once Yugoslavia, where his family comes from. He and his gracious and level-headed wife Shelly own a modest house in Seattle's quiet suburban university district. It's a communal sort of place. His sister Diana lives with them, as does tour manager Alex McLeod, a bright, ponytailed Scot so loyal he'd probably step in front of a bullet 
for any member of the band. Chris's brother Robert stops by all the time. Early in March, Sonic Youth's Kim Gordon and Thurston Moore stay there while they're in town to finish up a world tour. Gordon, Moore, and Mudhoney's Mark Arm stop by after a day of buying records one of which is an old Benny Goodman 78. As Royal Garden Blues emerges from the crackles and hisses of his old Victrola, Chris jokes to more, Yeah man, lo-fi. This is what our new record sounds like. A huge jukebox dominates the living room, which is decorated with funky old thrift shop furniture, but mostly everyone, including the cats Einstein and Doris, hangs out in the kitchen. The refrigerator is stocked with organic this and preservative-free that. Recycled paper is used wherever possible. A vintage late 50s dry bar and three pinball machines, Kiss, The Adams Family, and Evil Knievel, are down in the basement where Chris threw a party the night before the band left to record in utero. Old friends like Matt Lucan from Mudhoney, Tad Doyle from Tad, and Dee Plakis from L7 knew friends like Eddie Vedder, folks from Nirvana's extended family like Ernie Bailey, and a Geffen DGC a r artist and repertoire man Gary Gersh all partied into the wee hours. Shelley whipped up some vegetarian hors d'oeuvres. Chris lives low to the ground, spends his money wisely. This is hardly a high living rock star. The door falls off his aged tape deck. After a quick preliminary interview just before Christmas of 1992, the first round of more than 25 hours of interviews with Kurt took place in early February. They began very late at night, after Kurt would return from rehearsals for In Utero, lasting until 4 or 5 in the morning. In the midst of moving into a temporary home in Seattle, Kurt padded around his and Courtney's hotel suite in mismatched pajamas, chain smoking as he peppered his story with a surprise supremely dry and sarcastic wit. Once, he strapped on a virtual reality machine, something between a Walkman and a private psychedelic light show that he was experimenting with to control his chronic stomach pain. Various settings supposedly stimulate memory, creativity, energy, and relaxation. For internationally famous celebrities, Kurt and Courtney live a pretty no-frills lifestyle. There are no minders, no beefy bodyguards around them. Kurt takes a taxi around town, stops in the McDonald's for a burger, wearing a ridiculous Elmer Fudd hat pulled down on his head for a disguise. A visitor to their hotel room one night walked into the hotel, took the elevator to their floor, and walked right through their open door to find Kurt and Courtney in their pajamas and nestling together on the bed, watching a trashy Leaf Garrett TV movie in the dark. Oh, hi, Courtney said, not even startled. Kurt appears frail, rail thin. He speaks in a sort of deadpan sing-song, abraded by too many cigarettes into a low growl. It makes him seem sad and spent, as if he's just finished a crying jag, but that's just the way he is. Everyone thinks of me as this emotional wreck, this total negative black star all the time, Kurt says. They're always asking, what's the matter? And there's nothing wrong with me at all. I'm not feeling blue at all. It got to the point where I had to look at myself and figure out what people are seeing. I thought maybe I should shave my eyebrows. That might help. Although Kurt's charisma is almost palpable, he is profoundly low-key. It helps to mentally amplify his every reaction. A distracted hmph translate into wow. A quickie chuckle is a guffaw. A dirty look is murder. As in photographs, his face takes on many different aspects. Sometimes he looks like an angelic boy, sometimes like a dissipated wastrel, sometimes like the guy who fixes your transmission, and sometimes, in certain lights, he even looks eerily like Axl Rose. His pale complexion is lightly veiled by scruffy stubble. An angry red patch on his scalp shows through the trademark unwashed hair, which is strawberry blonde for the time being. He usually wears pajamas and is perpetually unkempt. Although the time of day has very little to do with his schedule, he always wears a watch bearing the likeness of Tom Peterson, the owner of a chain of appliance stores in Oregon. Kurt's eyes are so extremely blue that they give his face a perpetually startled expression. In his pajamas, he gives the impression of a shell-shocked young private padding around a veteran's home, but he doesn't miss a trick. By early March, after the recording of the band's new album, In Utero, Kurt, Courtney, and their baby Francis moved into a largish, 
rented house overlooking Lake Washington. At the kitchen table, Kurt would play at disemboweling a plastic anatomical model, chain smoking the whole time. I like the idea that you can take them all apart and just see the guts, he said. Organs fascinate me. They work, and a lot of times, they fuck up. But it's hard to believe that a person can put something as poisonous as alcohol or drugs in their system and the mechanics can take it for a while. It's amazing they take them at all. The place is sparsely furnished. There's beige wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and nothing on the walls. But this is just temporary. They'll be moving to a remodeled house in a small town a few dozen miles out of Seattle later this year, and they're looking for a pied de terre on Seattle's hip Capitol Hill. Upstairs is the bedroom, the baby's room, and Kurt's painting room, where an easel holds a portrait of a withered, forlorn creature with skeletal arms and lifeless black eyes. In the downstairs bathroom sits an MTV award for best new artist, the little silver astronaut keeping a close watch over the toilet. Francis's nanny, Jackie, has a room down in the basement. In the dining room off the kitchen, a model car track is set up. One room of the house is designated the mess room. The floor is covered with old letters, notes, work tapes, records, photographs, and posters dating back to the earliest days of Kurt's musical life. Against one wall is Courtney's Buddhist chanting shrine, which she doesn't use much anymore, probably because she can't get to it through the clutter. A brown paper bag has tipped over, disgorging a score or so of plastic Colonel Sanders and Pillsbury Doughboy dolls. Guitars are everywhere, even in the bathroom. A sonorous old Martin sits in the living room alongside a more modest instrument painted red and covered with flowers. Seven-month-old Frances Bean Cobain is a beautiful baby with her father's piercing blue eyes and her mother's jawline. Although her parents seem to dote on her for the benefit of the visitor, they are clearly loving. Kurt seems a little more graceful with children than Courtney, but both do a fine job of making the usual goo-goo noises for the obvious amusement of the baby. By all accounts, Francis did wonders for Kurt. He looks at Francis all the time and he says, that's the way I used to be. That's the way I used to be, Courtney says. You can't change a person, but my goal in life is to make him that happy again. But it's hard because he's always dissatisfied with stuff. One night, Courtney quietly strums an acoustic guitar into a boom box in the living room upstairs while down in the garage next to their used Volvo, Kurt bangs on a dilapidated drum set left over from some long forgotten tour. The garage is filled with boxes and boxes of papers, artwork, guitar guts, and years of thrift shop purchases. Two boxes are crammed with transparent plastic men, women, and even horses. Close by are an amplifier, a bass guitar, and the one thing in the house that could conceivably be called an indulgence. A Space Invaders type video game that Kurt picked up for a couple of hundred bucks. He records high scores on it with initials like COK, POO, and FUK. Our our conversations were extremely frank. Kurt has a simple explanation for his candor. I'm caught, he says, referring to his widely publicized problems with heroin, so I may as well fess up to it and try to put it in a little bit more perspective. Everyone thinks I've been a junkie for years. I was a junkie for a really small amount of time. Furthermore, he's not worried about exploding the bands or his own formidable myth. Quite the opposite. I never intended to have some kind of a mystery about us, he said to me once. It's just that I didn't have any thing to say in the beginning. Now that it's gone on long enough, there's a story, in a way. Still, every night after you leave, I think, God, my life is so fucking boring compared to so many other people that I know. Kurt is eager to set the record straight. There have been so many rumors about him, his wife, and even his infant daughter that he figures the best way he can cut his losses is just to tell exactly what happened. His tales are sometimes self-serving, full of rationalization and self-contradiction, but even his distortions are are revealing about his life, his art, and the connections between the two.